today on Grace to You. God doesn't want your respect. He wants your obedience. You talk about a high-risk action. Don't tell me that you advocate the slaughter of babies in the womb. You want to justify transgender activity. Don't tell me you, you want to invite more Muslims in who represent a religion from hell and then put your hand on the throne of God. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This morning, I'm going to uh, challenge you a little bit. Um, we're going to go into the Word of God, and I'm going to ask that you go with me and stay with me in this. And I can promise you the reward will be just exactly what you would expect when you give attention to the Word of God. But let's begin in Luke 17, verses. 20 to 25. We're going back to this passage. We've done that several times now. Luke 17, 20, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, He answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And He said to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away, do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in His day. But first, He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. We have just experienced an inauguration. The inauguration is an event designed to mark the ascent of ruling authority. It is by design to be as public as possible, to demonstrate to as many as possible the significance and power of the ruling authority. An inauguration is kind of a stepchild of a coronation, which is the declaration before all of the power and authority of a monarch, a king. Now, we've never had a king in America. We, in fact, pride ourselves on the American Revolution in which we threw off the rule of a king, a British king by the name of George III. We celebrate the fact that we have freed ourselves from kings. That has become much the way of the world. There are few monarchies who have actual kings. There are some symbolic kings, powerless symbolic kings and queens. There are some autocratic, military, monarchical dictators where one man rules with power even over life and death. But an absolute monarchy is very rare. There are only a few. We celebrate the end of monarchies the end of dictatorships, the end of kings. 
We hail democracy. In our country, we have spent countless dollars, countless lives, countless years trying to turn other countries into democracies like us. Now, I may shock you. The Bible doesn't advocate democracy. The Bible doesn't mention democracy. The Bible doesn't comment on democracy. The Bible doesn't define democracy. There is no place in all of the Bible where you even find democracy. There is no country revealed in Scripture where it existed. It is never affirmed by God. Was Israel a democracy? Never. What was it? It was a theocratic monarchy and God was king. Yahweh was their king. The covenant God was their king. The Lord Yahweh was Israel's king forever. There's only one God in the universe, and He, in His mercy and grace, gave Himself to a people, the Jews, to be their king. What an astonishing privilege, right? And everyone in the ancient world knew God was Israel's king. They knew about this God who had delivered them from Egypt. They knew about this God whose power had drowned the Egyptian army. They knew about this God who had sustained them for forty years in the wilderness. They knew about this God who had brought them into the land and allowed them to conquer powerful resident enemies. And they knew that the people worshipped this God because when they came into the land, they came in with the tabernacle, right, a tent. Everywhere they went with the tent, they set up camp. All the tribes were around a little box called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had cherubim because, because God dwells in the presence of the cherubim. That was the symbol of His throne. God is invisible, but God demonstrated His presence in a symbolic way in the ark. And they carried the ark everywhere they went, put it in the middle, and all the tribes focused in on the ark. If you don't think sin makes you stupid, get ready for this story. <laughs> Under attack from some Midianites, Israel decided they wanted a king. They wanted a king? You mean they wanted another king other than God, Yahweh? the God of the universe, the true King, Judge, Redeemer. Yes, they wanted a king. Well, who was, who was overseeing life in Israel before they had a king? God. It was a theocratic kingdom and God had agents. Those agents were judges and prophets. One of those Judges, turn in your Bible to Judges chapter 8, was a very familiar man by the name of Gideon. I, I, we don't have time for the entire story, but it's an incredible story of how God used Gideon. And it leads us into chapter 8, verse 22. Gideon had just had a great victory. The men of Israel said to Gideon, "'Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian.'" Let's start, let's start a family monarchy. 
You be our king. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. Why? What's the next line? The Lord shall rule over you. You don't trade him in for me. That's insane. The last of the judges, chapter 12, verse 12 says, A king shall reign over you, although the Lord your God was your king. This is the epic apostasy of Israel. Enter you know who, Saul. Saul that is going to be their king. Go over to chapter 10. They've selected Saul. I won't go through all that story, but um, Samuel, verse 17 of chapter 10, calls the people together, Mizpah, and he said to the sons of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have today rejected your God who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Thus Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. By the way, any king in Israel was supposed to be from the tribe of Judah. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the Matrite family was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was found. Saul, why him? Well, we, we already know because verse 23 says he was taller than anybody else. And more ha tall, dark, handsome, and cowardly. Verse 22 says, where's Saul? He's hiding in the baggage. Oh, great. <laughs> we got a tall, dark, handsome guy in the baggage, hiding. By the way, what did he do? Uh, he looked for lost donkeys. That was his job. Unfortunately, he didn't do it very well, couldn't find them. He went from one end of the land to the other end of the land, couldn't find them, and somebody said, oh, they're already back home. Tall, dark, handsome, cowardly donkey finder. <laughs> Sin makes you stupid, and it makes you make stupid choices about leadership. Who trades in the eternal God for a tall, dark, handsome, stupid donkey finder who wants to hide in the baggage? So why did God allow this as a judgment? If you understand that, as a judgment. You want a king? I'll give you a king. I'll give you a king that will show you how foolish you are to turn from God. Saul is the anti-king. He's the illustration of the worst kind of ruler. That's God's whole point. Saul was a complete disaster. And we know the, the sad story of it. The post-mortem on Saul, um, just a few verses, chapter 15, verse 23. Rebellion is as the sin of divination, insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. Saul was such a disaster. The people rejected the Lord to get Saul, and then the Lord rejected Saul because Saul rejected Him. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord in their words, your words, and because I feared the people and listened to your voice. There's the coward hiding in the baggage who fears the people, 
tall, dark, handsome, empty-headed donkey finder. He was a total disaster. You don't hear this very often in the Bible, verse 35 of chapter 15, the Lord regretted He had made Saul king over Israel. Oh, by the way, Samuel said, there's not going to be any future for you. You're done. The next king won't come from your family. Again, the wisdom from below is demonic, isn't it? Sin makes you stupid. The Lord was kind to them. The next king was who? David. And David was like Samuel. Twice it says, the Lord was with him. He was a man with a heart for God. But God reminded them with Saul that when you trade him in for anyone else, that wicked insanity is devastating, beyond shocking to me. There's a passage in Hosea, chapter 13, that is insightful. As Hosea the prophet pronounces judgment on Israel or Ephraim, listen to this, 13th chapter of Hosea. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He exalted himself in Israel, but through Baal he did wrong and died. And now they sin more and more and make for themselves molten images, idols skillfully made from their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore they will be like the morning cloud, like the dew which soon disappears, like chaff which is blown away from the threshing floor and like smoke from a chimney. They're going to disappear. They're going to vaporize, God says. Since I have been the Lord your God, since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except Me, for there is no Savior besides Me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. As they had their pasture, they became satisfied, and being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore they forgot Me. As He blessed them in the land of milk and honey, they forgot Him. So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lie in wait by the wayside. I will encounter them like a bear robbed of her cubs, and I will tear open their chests. There I will also devour them like a lioness, as a wild beast would tear them. He's promising them divine judgment. And it came at the hands of the Assyrians, who came in about 732 and took them all away, and they never returned. It is your destruction, O Israel, that you are against me, against your help. How does that happen? Where now is your king, that he may save you in all your cities? And your judges of whom you requested, give me a king and prince. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Some interesting realities in that 11th verse, those are imperfect verbs which means they're continuous action. Literally, I kept giving you kings in my anger and kept taking away in my wrath. And what it's referring to is in the northern kingdom, God gave them ten kings, all of them evil, wicked kings. He gave it as a judgment. He took them away as a judgment, gave them a worse one as a judgment, took them away. Action repeated again and again and again. The Lord said, you wanted a king, I gave you kings. I put them there in my anger, I removed them in my wrath. I put another one in my anger, removed them in my wrath. Your idolatry continued and it all ended after those ten kings and you going into captivity. So when you trade the true king for any other king, you have mocked God. Is there hope? Look at chapter 14 of Hosea. This is the heart of God. 
through the prophet, he's crying, "'Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to Him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say again, our God, to the work of our hands. We won't worship idols we make. For in you the orphan finds mercy. Do that and I will heal their apostasy. I'll love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I'll be like the dew to Israel, like the blossom on a lily. He'll take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout and His beauty will be like the olive tree and His fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. And those who live in His shadow will again raise green and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, or Israel, what more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am the luxuriant cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. The ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. Who is your God? Who is your King? Two hundred years of warning before the captivity came. Israel turned in their King, the true and living God, for a sequence of wicked rulers. They chose a fake, a fraud. They chose an anti-king, a kind of anti-Christ over the eternal King of the universe. Oh, by the way, God promised to send a king, and He did, a true king. He told David in 2 Samuel 7, I'm going to send someone out of your loins who will have an everlasting kingdom. There's only one true king, right? The tragedy of Israel's history, the tragedy of human history is that the world doesn't want to recognize the true King, the true and living God and His Son. But God has already determined His Son will be King. So the story of Israel is a story of blasphemy and a story of abomination. Story of apostasy, story of defection, inconceivably a story of trading in the one true God for the anti-king, the wicked king, the foolish king, Saul, trading in the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately for the anti-Christ fool named Caesar. It was during David's time, 2 Samuel chapter 6. I want to show you something. Let's close there. 2 Samuel chapter 6. So they finally want to bring the uh, ark back. There was a prescription for how the ark was to be moved. It had rings and you put up a long pole so that no one ever touched the ark. No one touched the ark. Took long poles, put them through the rings, carried it that way. They didn't do that. It says they wanted to move the, the ark. And um, verse 3, they placed the ark of God on a new cart. What is that? That's a clear violation of God's order. So they could bring it from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. A couple of guys named Uzzah and Ahio uh, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all his house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir uh, wood and with harps 
lyres, tambourines, castanets, cymbals. This is like a coronation now. God's coming back. They're going to re-enthrone God in the place where He belongs. Verse 6, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it, started to topple off the ark. So Uzzah reached out to steady it. Look at verse 7, the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died by the ark of God. Let me say something. You better be careful when you put your hand on God. I thought of that in that inauguration. You can say whatever you want to say, but when you touch the ark, when you place your hand on the throne of God because God is enthroned in His Word, and you place your hand on the Word of God and pledge to do the very things that blaspheme His name. You talk about a high-risk action. All Uzzah did was what he thought was showing some respect. God doesn't want your respect. He wants your obedience. Don't tell me that you advocate the slaughter of babies in the womb. Don't tell me you want to destroy masculinity, femininity, marriage. Don't tell me you want to fill the world with LGBTQ people in leadership. You want to justify transgender activity. Don't tell me you, you want to invite more Muslims in who represent a religion from hell and then put your hand on the throne of God. You can make any pledge you want. Don't mock God. The message has to end here. Seek the kingdom, right? Seek the kingdom by seeking the king. Repent, the King is here. Repent and receive the gospel. False religion, error, lies, and hypocrisy are nothing new to our generation. In fact, Christ himself dealt with these issues when encountering the most influential religious leaders of his day. In his book, Jesus Unleashed, Pastor John examines many of those encounters and demonstrates the example Christ was in standing for truth with confidence. Call 888-57-GRACE to order your own copy of Jesus Unleashed, that's 888-57-GRACE, or visit our online store at gty.org. In this compact hardcover book, you'll see truth triumph again and again. Thank you for joining us today in Unleashing God's Truth one verse at a time.